have to have the intention of what it is. Subhanahu wa ta'ala, in verse 120, according to, for example, the Hanafi school of thought, the third verse within the fourth chapter, where Allah subhanahu wa أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم The fourth chapter سورة النساء or the woman is the second longest chapter within the Holy Quran with 176 verses revealed in the holy city of Medina, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dedicates the majority of the verses within the fourth chapter to discuss the affairs of women. And of course, there are many related issues that are discussed within this chapter. For example, marriage is extensively discussed within the fourth chapter. Divorce, likewise, is discussed within the fourth chapter. The notion of polygamy is also introduced in the fourth chapter. Inheritance for women is mentioned within the fourth chapter. The laws and regulations of dowry or mahr pertaining to women is also discussed within the fourth chapter. Family related issues are also discussed within the fourth chapter. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala discusses many issues relating to women within this chapter and that is why the 176 verses are entitled with the title of Al-Nisa, the woman. However, scholars do believe that the naming of the fourth chapter was also part of the occurring revolution of Islam since its establishment until that very day. How so? When Islam was born within the Arabian Peninsula, it began a revolution, a revolution of reform, to reform the evil, to remove the evil within society and to create, to create a revolution of ethics morality and to uplift the standards of living for people so allah subhanahu wa allah subhanahu wa ta'ala within the holy quran for example introduces the notion of equality in creation that all men are indeed created equal regardless of their race regardless of their gender, regardless of their position, regardless of their wealth, regardless of their color, all men are created equal. And the only thing that superiorizes one human being above the other is his or her moral and ethical standards. It's the akhlaq, it's the piety, the righteousness. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly states that within the Holy Quran. Ya ayyuhal nas, O you mankind, inna khalaqnakum min dhakarin wa untha. We created you from men and women. You all go back to one single father and one single mother, Adam and Eve. Inna khalaqnakum min dhakarin, means one man, wa untha, one woman. Then, وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ شُعُوبًا وَقَبَائِلٍ We put you in different colors and races and nationalities لِتَعَارَفُوا So that you get to know one another. And that, of course, has 
its own meaning that we have to think of and contemplate on. وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ شُعُوبًا وَقَبَائِلًا لِتَعَارَفُوا Then Allah says, إِنَّ أَكْرَمَكُمْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ أَتْقَاكُمْ For indeed, the best of you is the one with taqwa. And taqwa is the peak of morality and ethics. Similarly, Allah within the Holy Quran introduces the notion of freeing slaves or to abolish slavery. And Islam has a stance against slavery for a man to be owned by another man. That is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala within the Quran introduces many of the kafarat, the penalties for certain sins within the Holy Quran to be the freeing of slaves. Not only through that, but Allah encouraged the freeing of the slaves and the marriage of the slaves with the free. I mean, just think about it. It's one thing where you abolish slavery. It's one thing where you no longer have slaves. But it's a huge step from abolishing slavery to introducing marriages within slaves and the free. And the Arabian Peninsula truly was not ready for such a reform. But, the Islam, but Islam pushed this reform anyways. And Allah within the Quran, chapter 2 says, وَلَأَمَةٌ مُؤْمِنَةٌ خَيْرٌ مِنْ مُشْرِكَةٌ وَلَوْ أَعْجَبَتْكُمْ If you were to marry a mu'mina, a believing, pious, righteous woman who is a slave, it is indeed better for you than to marry a mushrika that does not have those moral and ethical standards. وَلَعَبْدٌ مُؤْمِنٌ خَيْرٌ مِنْ مُشْرِكٍ وَلَوْ أَعْجَبَكُمْ And a slave man indeed is better for you to marry if he were to have those ethical and moral standards than a mushrik that does not enjoy them. Similarly, part of that reform was to change the paradigm of people and societies, nations all around the world in regards to their perception of women. Whether it was within their family, whether it was within their societies, whether it was within their communities, to change the way that they perceive the female gender as second or third class citizens within society. So Allah within the Qur'an introduced many noble women within the Qur'an so that they become the example for all believers including men. Allah gives the example of Maryam, the Virgin Mary, the mother of Jesus. Maryam ibn Imran. Allah also introduces another noble woman, the wife of Pharaoh, Asiya bint Muzahim. إذ قالت رب ابن لي عندك بيتا في الجنة ونجني من فرعون وعمله ونجني من القوم الظالمين. Allah subhanahu wa taala also introduces another woman. Who endured hardship and difficulties. The mother of Musa. Salam Allahi alayhi. And again, part of that reform was that Allah dedicated the second longest chapter within the last revelation to the affairs of women and entitled this chapter Al Nisa. The woman who were not able to speak did not have an opinion, who were treated as less than second or third class citizens within a society, have now an entire chapter dedicated to them and to their affairs. Furthermore, the affairs of family, the affairs of marriage, the, divorce, the affairs of divorce, the affairs of society at large are also introduced within this chapter and they fall under the title of woman, saying what? That they are the ones that navigate the family. They are the ones that create 
uh, environment of peace and tranquility and love and harmony within the home. So the prior importance is given to them. Within this chapter, there are many important verses. Verses that are sometimes misunderstood. Verses that are sometimes misused. Misused in what sense? Sometimes misused by Muslims. And sometimes misunderstood by non-Muslims in regards to Islam. Let me shed some light on those verses and inshallah we will then enter our main discussion. Wa sallu ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. The first verse that I want to speak of is the third verse within the fourth chapter where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in khiftum alla taqsutu fil yatama fankihu ma taba lakum min nisa where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala introduces the notion of polygamy where a man in Islam is allowed to marry more than one wife or up to four wives. Now, right off the bat, many of the people will tell you this law has already expired. Such law should no longer exist. And on the other hand, others have misused their, this law or this permission given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala within different societies or cultures so it keeps this permission given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a misunderstood permission but let us understand that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala introduces a law or a regulation this law and regulation cannot be manufactured for one person only for example Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibits drinking. You cannot drink. Not even a small cup, not even a dot of alcohol. Some people might tell you, but this law shouldn't be applicable to everyone because the idea is not being intoxicated, right? I don't want to be intoxicated. Islam is against intoxication. But believe me, if I drink a cup, nothing's going to happen. If I drink a glass of, for example, beer or wine or whatever it may be, it doesn't affect me, not even a bit. So imagine if Allah came and said, look, go observe yourself. If, it, if you get intoxicated by one glass or one cup or one bottle, then that's haram for you, you should drink half. Others who don't get intoxicated so quickly, they can drink up to two cups, one bottle, whatever it may be. No. Islam is not going to make regulations and laws for one type of individuals. Islam, when it regulates or creates a law, it's for all societies at all times. All the residents of the earth, the entire population. Yes, today when I look at myself and I look at my family, I say, there is no need for polygamy. But what about, for example, a country like Iraq? where it has one million widows, one million, and five million orphans. Six million people are in need of a home, are in need of a fatherly figure, are in need of someone to take care of them. Now without emotions and biases, let's think about this. What's going to happen to all those women who do not have somebody to support them? Some of them can take care of themselves, some of them have fathers, some of them have uncles, some of them. But what about the majority of them who do not have anybody to take care of them? And what's going to happen to those children who live out in the street, who look at other children and they have parents, they have clothes, they have shoes, they have food. They have security, but they have nothing. So we 
stand firmly against polygamy, yet those children are the ones that are going to be part and parcel of this society. 20 years from now, they're going to be the criminals within that society because that's what they grew up with. Poverty, anger, depression. Anger towards everything. They don't deserve a fatherly figure, somebody who can take care of them. So Islam has given a permission for those capable to extend their borders of family to another family who have lost, for example, a woman who has lost her husband. Another selfish issue here that I want to talk about in a country, for example, like Lebanon or a country like Iraq now, a lot of people who are losing, a lot of the women who are losing their husbands, why are they losing their husband? What? What is it? Is it mass illnesses? No. It's because they allowed, she allowed her husband to walk out of that door and to go fight ISIS so that you can live in security. So that you can, you and your children can live in peace. Same thing with a lot of the mothers and a lot of the wives in Lebanon during the war. While you held on to your husband and your son, some of those mothers, some of those wives were not so selfish. She said to him, I allow you to go. Defend this land. Defend our freedom. Defend our honor. Defend our dignity. Keep us as honorable human beings. وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمْ or else, if ISIS were to come to your town, then every woman will be taken as captives and slaves. Then they'll be sold in the slavery market. Now, when this woman has nobody to take care of her, and the Quran regulates a law so that if she desires a second marriage, she can. She may be able to. So what I'm trying to say is when we look at one ayah from the Qur'an or we read one ayah from the Qur'an, we should not jump to conclusions immediately. And I'll get to that. That this is a law only for, for man to have fun. No. Indeed, it's not that. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam who was the exemplary figure and he de illustrated and demonstrated the verses of the Quran. Every single woman that he married was either older than him or widowed. And her husband had died at, at a war. Rasulullah never married a woman because she was young and he was getting old. Never married a woman because he was the one that chased her and said, you know what, because you're so beautiful, I want to marry you. Out of lust or out of worldly desires. Of course, I tell you, the reason why this law is so misunderstood, it's because it has been abused by a lot of Muslim men. Because if he were to marry, he's not going to go and marry a widow, for example, who's in need of support. He's not going to go and marry somebody that's, for example, his age or older than him if he's in his 50s. He's going to go marry somebody young, somebody beautiful. And what happens? We'll come to the second ayah that I want to talk about. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in verse 129 says, You cannot establish equality between women. But you must strive. To establish that equality amongst the, for example, two or three wives that you have. And this is the most overlooked ayah by every man that has married more than one wife. And that is why this law and this permission is so defamed. It's so misunderstood. What do I mean? The guy, for example, he's 40, 50, 60 years old. Sometimes 70. 
and he goes and marries a young lady, his wife who's endured all those difficulties, all those years of hardship, she's given him children, she married him when he was poor, he didn't have anything, now that he has money, he goes and marries a younger wife. Then what happens? Then, throughout the year, he's in a constant honeymoon with this woman. If he were to buy, he buys for her. If he were to vacation, he vacations with her. If he were to laugh, he laughs with her. If he were to go out to a restaurant, he goes out with her. Everything is now with her. And this poor woman who endured all those years, the pain and the misery and the difficulties, and giving birth and raising the children is now forgotten. So people say, look at Islam, look at the injustice. This is not Islam. And this person is not implementing the laws of Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will hold this man accountable just like any person who has done dhulm or injustice. And this is pure injustice. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you cannot be just in what way? In a way that, listen, it's difficult. Sometimes you have two people who you're involved with. You may, through your heart, desire one over another, but make sure that is not shown. Make sure that is not felt. Make sure that is not observed. There has to be equality. The ulama say even up to the hour. If you spend six hours here, you have to spend six hours here. You take one wife for a vacation, you have to take the other one. This one has a castle, the other one is in a small apartment. That's not how it works. The fuqaha have spoken extensively of how is it that one can implement adalah, justice and equality within the family. Another ayah that I want to speak of is the 22nd verse. وَلَا تَنْكِحُوا مَا نَكِحَ آبَاءُكُمْ إِلَّا مَا قَدْ سَلَفْ And do not marry the wives that your fathers married. Who would do that? Marry his own stepmom. That's what it is. The Arabs. The guy would marry 5, 6, 10, 15, as much as he could. And until today, you see, until today, sometimes you get videos on WhatsApp. The guy has, for example, 90 wives, 400 kids, has his own village. So men then would marry 5, 10, 15 wives. It would be normal. The, one that, the ones that had money. And the ones that didn't would barely be able to afford one wife. That's how society was. Not, even, not just in the Arabian Peninsula, but look at the rich in any society at that time. They all had many wives. When they die, what happens? Those women would be inherited just like anything else, just like the cattle, the horses, the cows, the sheep, the houses, the lands. The woman would also be part of the inheritance. Part of the inheritance, the children would come and marry those wives again. Or they can gift them to whoever they like. I like her, I'll take her, but this one, she's old, I'll give her to my friend. That's how it worked. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تَرِثُ النِّسْ وَلَا تَنْكِحُوا مَا نَكَحَ آبَاءُكُمْ The next ayah, which comes before this ayah, 419, has a beautiful message. It says, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا لَا يَحِلُّ لَكُمْ أَن تَرِثُ النِّسَاءَ كَرْهَا it's the same message that you cannot inherit women against their will. They're not a mean of inheritance. And Islam abolished that. And Islam stood against that. And Islam said, you cannot inherit women. They're free human beings. Against their will. 
So we say, Alhamdulillah, this doesn't exist anymore. Who's going to inherit women against their will? It happens until today. How so? This poor woman in some societies, she cannot choose who she marries. Her cousin has inherited her. And if she wants to marry someone other than her own cousin, they would have to pay this guy some money. They, ha they would have to seek his permission. They would have to ask the uncle, is it okay if we marry our daughter to someone else just in case you're going to get upset? So she says, no, I'm not going to allow. What if we give you, for example, $50,000? Okay. And those people call themselves Muslim. It's part of our Islamic society. Huh? Not just that. But I see fathers today in the Western world, in America, in Canada, in Europe, they do not give their daughters the choice. She's grown up all her life. She grew up, she grew up here in the time of marriage. He tells her, I have to take you back home. Why? We're going for a vacation, don't worry. There the vacation turns into... A wedding. Where? At the grandma's house with one of the cousins. And they think that this is going to ensure the happiness for this young woman. I'm not against it if they're okay with it. They want each other. Islam is not against it either. But it's a form of inheritance where this guy, this uncle has inherited this girl. He wants her for his son. And there is no other way around it. And whether she accepts or she doesn't accept, that has to happen. Well, what happens when they come back? What happens when they come back to live together? There isn't going to be harmony. There isn't going to be love. There isn't going to be respect. There isn't going to be any chemistry. And that is why you find so many families ruined and destroyed within the Middle East today. And within the Muslim families living in the West that think they're living in the Middle East. They have the same mindset. Today I tell you, reports have shown that divorce rates are now even more within Islamic countries than some Muslim societies than the West. Because this woman, she doesn't like her husband. He doesn't like her either, probably, because she doesn't like him. Right? He's out. She's watching soap operas, Turkish soap operas. Don't tell me you haven't heard of this phenomenon of the Turkish soap operas. That's destroying all the homes. I read an article... That divorce trade is skyrocketing even in Baghdad because of the Turkish soap operas. Baba, in Baghdad, you have to worry about if you're going to be living this evening. Anytime there could be a car bomb, a bomb, a, you know, assassin that's going to take your life. You're sitting watching Turkish soap operas and then obviously there is the internet and all sorts of things. And you see the divorce and the... Problems within the family. Why? Because we don't read the Quran in a contemporary manner. We say, yeah, they, those people used to inherit women at that time, but it's gone now. No, this is also a form of volm and inheritance. And force. And that's why you find shattered families and homes. The last verse that I want to use as the highlight of the chapter is actually the first verse within the chapter. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a very powerful beginning. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ya ayyuhal nas, O you mankind, ittaqu rabbakum. Believe in your Lord. Believe in your Lord. Alladhi khalaqakum min nafsin wahidah. Who created you from one nafs. 
from one single soul. Meaning what? Meaning the position of men and women is equal. Returns back to one single soul. And from that one single soul, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَخَلَقَ مِنْهَا زَوْجَهَا Then that single soul became two. زَوْجَهَا It became a pair. وَبَثَّ Then Allah established, وَبَثَّ مِنْهَا رِجَالًا كَثِيرًا وَنِسَاء Then Allah created men and women from that single soul. Then Allah again says, Wattaqullah. Again reminds us that this needs taqwa. This was a response to a lot of the Christians who believed that Adam was created. Then from the leftovers of the clay of Adam, Eve was created. The Jews who believed that Eve was created from the ribs of Adam. Allah says no. He created one single soul, made it a pair from one, made one, from one, from the other made woman. And they are, all, they are all equal. Tonight, I want to speak of laws and regulations in regards to divorce and marriage. Within the school of the Imamiyah, the Shia school of thought, and in comparison to the other madahib, specifically the Hanbali, the Shafi'i, the Maliki, and the Hanafi madhab. Schools outside the Imamiyah or the Shia or the followers of Ahlul Bayt. And before I do that, I want to remind you of things that all Muslims agree on. That number one, marriage is something that is encouraged in the religion of Islam. Divorce is something that is discouraged and the religion of Islam, and there isn't an institution more honorable within the religion of Islam than the institution of family. Let us examine six areas in marriage and six areas in divorce. وَصَلُّوا عَلَىٰ مُحَمَّدٍ وَآلِ مُحَمَّدٍ ثاني غفر الله لكم The first area in marriage laws regulating marriage is that the followers of Ahl al-Bayt state that the sigha the terminology in marriage has to be done in the past tense, meaning zawaj to ke, it happened in the past. Why? Because of two reasons. Number one, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala within the Quran, that is how He marries Rasulullah. Within the verse that says, Falamma qada zaydun minha wataran. Zawajna kaha. It happened in the past. To Zainab bint Jahsh. Another is imagine if you were to say, Atazawajuki. I will marry you. Versus I married you. When will you marry me? Now? An hour from now? A year from now? So the first, it comes to the Terminology of marriage and the followers of Ahl al-Bayt, the school of Ahl al-Bayt is extremely particular that the so-called sigha, the terminology of marriage takes place in the past tense. Two, the ulama of imamiyya say yushtaratu al-fawr fil ijabi wal-qabool. When the woman says zawaj to kanafsi, the man has to immediately say qabil to zawaj. When one marries, the other accepts immediately, not with a gap in between. Versus other scholars from other schools of thought, the schools I mentioned, believe no, la yajibul fawr, it doesn't have to be immediate. And 
One of the imams of the schools that I mentioned writes that imagine if a woman, if a man writes a request in marriage to a woman, and this woman lives in another country. So they, she, he, he gives this letter to the ambassador, and he takes it to the, to the mailman, and he takes it, it takes four days, five days, a month. He, for example, goes from Mecca to Sham. Then the woman is there, she reads the letter, she brings some people, and she says, the watch took an FC. I married you myself. So the messenger hears this and he goes, sits on the, for example, camel or horse or whatever it may be, and he travels again for another 50 days, 60 days, a month, 10 days, and he says, the woman says, Zawaj took an FC. He says, Qabil to Zawaj. And the marriage takes place. The followers of Ahlul Bayt, the Imamiya ulama, they don't allow this. Why? For obvious reasons. Maybe by the time the messenger gets there, his guy is going to be dead. He's changed his mind. She's changed her mind. She married someone else. She doesn't want him anymore. Circumstances change. People should have the ability to choose. Just like when you're buying something, because aqd, from the way we understand it, is like any other transaction. We have aqd al to buy. We have, for example, aqd al to rent. And we also have aqd nikah to marry. Imagine you come and you tell someone, I sell you my vehicle for $5,000. He goes, 10 days later, he says, I'll buy your vehicle for... What do you mean you buy mine? I told you 10 days ago. He says, well, I thought it's still standing. Another issue is ta'liq. What is ta'liq? Ta'liq, which is prohibited by the imami school of thought and allowed by the other schools of thought, says... <coughs> <laughs> if the man or the woman, any one of them, says, I will marry you in the beginning of next month. So the beginning of the next month begins the marriage. Now, it's not a promise. Yeah, you can say, I'll marry you in the next month. Then you go there and then you get married. At that time, she has the option to say, I don't want to marry you anymore. Or he has the option of saying, look, there's no marriage anymore. But they allow what's called ta'liq. I will marry you in the beginning of next month, 10 days from now. Or, or I will marry you if my mother dies. Never know what's going to happen. When is that going to happen? I will marry you once I leave prison. So as soon as he leaves prison, the marriage takes place. The imamiyah say no. Whenever that time comes, if it were to come, you have to have a fresh aqd, a new aqd, in that moment, and the marriage takes place. Another issue I want you to give me your attention. They, the imamiyah say, the ulama of the imamiyah say, that in marriage, the person has to have what's called al-qasd he has to have the intention of what it is that he's saying if he tells a woman or she tells him the watch to kfc she has to mean it it's not a joke what if she was joking with him they're joking she tells him the watch to kfc he says qabiltu they say that's a marriage there's no way out of it by only through a divorce another as the marriage of the sakran, the intoxicated, somebody, two people are intoxicated, they don't know what they're doing, so they get married while they're intoxicated, while they're drunk. The next day, did we get married? Yeah, apparently we got married. Wow. So what's going to happen now? That's it, we're married. Well, that's not how it works in the imami school of thought. They have to be aware. They cannot be intoxicated. He has to, they both have to mean what they're saying for the family 
to be established. This one, Wallahi, I don't know how this still exists, this, this fatwa and this theory still exists, but it does exist. The Imamiyah believe whether a child was born out of wedlock, out of marriage, or na'udhu billah, out of zina and adultery, it's still the person's child. He's still responsible for the child. He has to take care of the child. They say no, that child is nothing. He's nothing. Therefore, when it comes to marriage, the Malikis and the Shafi'is allow a man to marry his own daughter which was born out of wedlock. His own sister who, which was married out of wedlock. His own niece which was married out of wedlock. You see, it's not that the imamis came and created certain laws by themselves. And other schools of thought came and created laws by themselves. No, they all go back to their imams. The imams of Ahlul Bayt, salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhim, allowed us to live in the state of prosperity. through their ahadith, through their admonishment, through guiding us and supporting us with their riwayat and their ahadith. So when you hear of such things, we're shocked. If you were in that specific school of, school of thought that allows this issue, is it a time for you to go and rethink what type of school of thought is this and what type of imam is it that I am following in the school of thought? Maybe I shall reevaluate whether I should follow Ja'far ibn Muhammad al Sadiq or follow someone else. It's simple. Ask yourself today. But unfortunately, it is the bias. It is people who don't think, who don't read, who do not illuminate their minds that follow schools that contain such issues. And this is only, obviously, in particular to marriage and divorce. Let's speak of some laws, six laws pertaining divorce. The first law, the madhab of Ahl al-Bayt and the Imamiyah, it is mandatory at the time of divorce to have two Witnesses who are adil, just. Two witnesses who are adil and just according to the Quran. وَأَشْحِدُوا the way adlin minkum. You have to have two just witnesses, two pious witnesses in the time of divorce. Why? First of all, it's because the Quran says, but what is the philosophy behind it? The obvious philosophy is if you bring two adil shuhud who are just and pious and you tell them I want to divorce my wife. The first thing they tell you is, have you tried to talk to her? Have you tried to seek some counseling? Is it any way that I can help? Is there a way that we can save this marriage, save this family? Not one, but two. So the second, ma second one will also come and say, maybe it's not time, maybe we should wait. That's one. Another issue is because if this woman got divorced without any witnesses, just witnesses. Why just? Because people trust them. They're not liars. They're not people who make up stories. They're just, they're adil. Tomorrow if she wants to get married, they say, how is it that you're getting married? Did you even get a divorce? She says, yes, go and ask those two individuals who everybody knows and trusts, so she can get remarried. However, in the other schools of thought, no, 
There needs, there not, there isn't a need for witnesses. So the man within his bedroom at any given time tells his wife, "You're divorced. Get out of here." And the divorce takes place. Another issue is that the imamiyah are firm that a woman cannot be in her menstrual cycle during divorce. One reason is because he cannot divorce her remotely. Imagine he's traveling, and at that time there is no cell phones. There is. So he's not there. He divorces his wife. Then he comes back later, and he tells her, look, I divorced you three days ago. The Imamiya say he has to be aware if she is in Hayv or, or the menstrual cycle. So that when he is divorcing her, she is aware. He has to ask her. And second, it's an obvious reason that hopefully after the menstrual cycle, maybe something will happen that will bring them back together. All that... Needless to say, the school of Ahl al-Bayt is protecting the family and delaying marriage, delaying the divorce. Another is the issue of qasd, again, in the matter of divorce. What do I mean? Other schools of thought, and until today, cases go and study Cases within the family courts of the Emirates, for example, or Egypt. They tell you a guy, by, as a joke, he sent his wife a text message that I'm divorcing you. She took it to court, she showed it to the judge, and he said, yes, you're divorced. So the guy comes and says, I send a text message as a joke. He says, but you send it. Didn't you send it? I send it. Well, your wife is divorced. Another case study. Recently in Egypt, some guy, when he was sleeping, sleeping. I don't know what his wife did to him when he was sleeping, but he says to her, you're divorced. So the next thing he wakes up, the wife is gone. He calls her, where did you go? He says, you divorced me yesterday. Where did I divorce you? You divorced me in your sleep. They go to court, and the judge says, if you said the words, that's it. She's divorced. If somebody's drunk, like the king of Persia, when he divorced his wife, and he divorces his wife, next thing you know, she's divorced, because he said the words. The followers of Ahl al-Bayt say no. He has to be aqil. At that time he has to be aware of what he's saying. He cannot be in a state where he's upset. He's angry. He doesn't know what he's saying. He cannot be intoxicated. He has to be aware. And he has to mean it when he's saying it. Another issue is very interesting here. If a person is forced to divorce his wife, they go and put a gun onto his head, they tell him, look, you have to divorce your wife or else we're going to kill you. So he says, okay, I divorced my wife. Guess what? This guy's wife is divorced. The Imamiyah do not accept this divorce. They say if a million times he said, my wife is divorced, wallah, she's divorced, don't kill me. And as soon as he leaves, she's still his wife. Nothing's going to change. Because he's mukrah. He's divorcing her by force. Not according to his own will and desire. Another issue, the fifth issue when it comes to divorce is the siga, the terminology in which divorce takes place with the followers of Ahl al-Bayt, the Imamiyah, 
they are particular about the terminology being in Arabic, being in that specific manner, and done with the two witnesses while she is not in her menstrual cycle, all the things <coughs> done accordingly in that particular manner. Okay? But according to, for example, the Hanafi school of thought, even by ima gestures, she can get divorced. I don't know sign language, but let's pretend they both know sign language. So he, with a gesture, tells her you're divorced. She's divorced. Or, not directly tell her you're divorced, but indirectly tells her I can no longer see you without hijab. That means what? That means you're div she's divorced. I can no longer, for example, share the same bed with She's divorced. I no longer can desire you. She's divorced. The third issue that I'm going to conclude with, the sixth issue that I'm going to conclude with, with is the three divorces at once. The Imamiyah have forbidden the three divorces at once. But other schools of thought, they allow three divorces to take place in one moment. So imagine, there shouldn't be witnesses. It doesn't matter whether she is in Tahr, in state of purity or not. It doesn't matter if this person is aware of what he's saying. He could be drunk, he could be angry. It doesn't matter how he says the terminology of divorce. Then he divorces his wife three times in a row. What happens to a family with such laws and regulations? What happens to the most honorable institution and the religion of Islam? I'll conclude with those two riwayat. One is by Ibn Abbas. And Nisa'i narrates that the fatwa of Ibn Abbas was that if a man marry, divorces his wife three times, it counts as one. How so? He says a man came to Rasulullah and he was very upset, he was depressed. Rasulullah said, what's wrong with you? He says, I divorced my wife three times. I can't go back to her. He says, return to her for it counts as one. So Ibn Abbas would not allow three divorces to take place at once. The book of history, Tariq al-Kabir of Bukhari, and other reliable historians say that in the time of Rasulullah, three divorces would not happen. And he himself says that a man divorced his wife three times. She, a man divorced his wife three times. The wife came to Rasulullah. Ya Rasulullah, my husband, last night he divorced me three times. So he says, go and call your husband. The guy came. Rasulullah says to him, your divorce did not count as three. It counts as one. If you want, return to your wife. So he says, Ya Rasulullah, I divorced her three times. My word as a man is one. I cannot change my word. Rasulullah says to him, Atuharrafu al-Quran wa ana hayyun baynakum. You're changing the Quran while I'm still alive amongst you. So he says it did not happen in the time of Rasulullah. It did not happen in the time of Abu Bakr. And two years out of the Khilafah of Umar ibn al-Khattab. After two years in an incident, a man comes to Umar and he says, O oh Khalifa, if people, he doesn't want his wife. He doesn't want to wait, divorce her once, then divorce her again, then divorce her. He wants to get rid of her now. Why are you stopping her? So he says, well, this is a good idea, really. Sometimes you just want to get rid of them. Why wait all that time? 
So let's allow the three divorces. And from that point until today, the Muslim world suffers in the area of family. And we said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals the second longest chapter within the Holy Quran to protect the family, to honor women, to uplift them within society. What type of honor is this? That in one second, without knowing what he's saying, how he's acting, whether he's drunk or he's not, through an SMS, he divorces his wife three times. Is this the philosophy of Islam and the spirit of Islam? and exists until today. So imagine the reason behind the rise of Sayyidina wa Mawlana Abu Abdullah al Hussein. In kana deenu Muhammadin lam yastaqim illa biqatliya ya suyuf khudini. I am the sacrifice of the religion of Islam. I am the sacrifice of the Quran. I am the sacrifice to enable people to follow the right path. And that is why until today every man who follows the correct mannerism of Islam is indebted to Sayyidina wa Mawlana al-Imam al Hussein. And whatever we do and the time we spend and the money we spend and the energy we spend, we cannot repay the greatest sacrifice made in history. That is why when you speak to him, you say to him, As-salamu alayka ya waritha Adam asafwatillah. As-salamu alayka ya waritha Nuh al-Nabiyyillah. Isa ruhillah. Musa kalimillah. Muhammadin habibillah. Because he is the one that saved the religion of Islam. And by saving the religion of Islam, he saved the message of Adam to the message of Khatam. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.